So good evening. Welcome to UX and Data. So tonight we have Brian Fu, and I'm super excited because I heard a version of this talk, and it was really awesome. Um, Brian is a data visualization artist at the American Museum of Natural History, where he designs interactive exhibits using scientific data and research. He most recently designed a permanent exhibit about climate change in the museum's Hall of Planet Earth using open data. His personal work uses data to create music, objects, and physical spaces, and has been featured in Information is Beautiful, NPR, and the Museum of Art and Design. Please welcome Brian. Hi. Um, yeah, thanks for coming tonight. Um, yeah, basically today I'll be talking about uh, the process and challenges of creating uh, music through data. Um, but I guess before I do that, I'm going to um, kind of talk about a bit of my background and how I got there. And then after uh, I talk through this project, um, I'll kind of talk about what I've been doing recently. One feature of my work is that it's, it's all on the web. Um, and that's kind of part of how I work. I try to make everything public um, and all the things that you see in here, um, you could just go to my website and, and look at it. Uh, all my projects are, are, I try to have them pretty well documented. And um, if there is anything that is uh, created by code, um, all the code is usually open source. So um, that's one aspect of that. Uh, so a bit of my background. My background is in a combination of computer science and visual arts. Uh, so I uh, have been coding for a couple decades. Um, and for most of my life, uh, including through college and after college, um, those two worlds are mostly separate. So I uh, mostly made money through building websites and, and programming. Um, and um, the art that I did was most, mostly visual arts um, and, you know, was like painting and drawing and printmaking and things like that. So um, those worlds were, were mostly separate for most of my life. Um, it wasn't until about uh, seven years ago I started working at the New York Public Library. Um, and um, there is kind of where I started to think about those two things uh, together. Um, and kind of the glue... Uh, that kind of binding them to get together is this idea of like um, digital humanities or um, information or, or data or, or education. This idea of kind of using um, uh, data sets or materials and um, exploring them in, in interesting ways using uh, computer science, algorithms, um, machine learning, things like that. Uh, so I actually, uh, while working at the New York Public Library, I worked in a group called Labs, New York Public Library Labs, that unfortunately no longer exists. Um, so we were kind of a small group of um, uh, developers and designers, and we uh, were tasked to think about um, how can the, the library um, uh, co accomplish its mission in, in kind of the digital age, where people are less likely to go to the library to create, to research, and things like that. And, and um, thinking about how um, the mission, which is still relevant, you know, kind of uh, increasing access to information, to materials, uh, encourage creation, learning, all that stuff. Uh, how can the library do that um, in, in, the, in the digital age? So um, a lot of our work was around just basic um, stuff, like digitizing things and putting them on the web. Um, when I actually started working at the library, um, one of the first things I had to do was uh, to uh, innovate on the, the, way, that w the way that people um, uh, view uh, video at the research, one of the research libraries. And innovation is basically, from the library's point of view, um, what you had to do previously was you go to the library, you request you know, a particular video, and you're on these like little kiosks or, or something, and you, you type in your thing, you search, you press play, and what actually happens is that when you press play, somebody downstairs takes the, the tape and like you know puts it in a player and presses play and waits for you to press stop, <laughs> and then they press stop. So it, it's like this like weird delay, but it's actually an actual like person uh, controlling the video. So that's kind of the level of innovation we, we were getting at. So it was. Um, so it, 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 a lot of it was kind of infrastructure for you know, creating this workflow of how to uh, get a lot of you know, the hundreds of thousands or you know, millions of things that the, the library has, get it digitized, so everything from books to video to music. 
um, getting it digitized, getting on the web, getting it searchable, getting it discoverable. So that 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 was a, a big part of our work. Um, but uh, the the part that I was very really interested in was, you know, what happens after digitization? What happens when you put uh, all these things online? Because there's a lot of things, especially um, like maps or manuscripts or books, they don't, they aren't really that usable um, as images. You know, you could just put put a whole book or telephone book on the on the on the web, and it's not searchable. So um, what we did is that we combined um, things like computer vision, machine learning, as well as crowdsourcing. Uh, to extract structured data um, out of our materials. So, um, so that, that was a big part of our work. And, and then um, making that data also available as a resource and then um, doing interesting, interesting things with that data to show that that data is useful and uh, that, it's, that it's there. And um, to obviously highlight uh, some of the collections that we have and um, you know, kind of increase the use of those things. So um, this is one of the first projects uh, that I did around that. Um, so a few years ago, uh, we released about 200,000 images uh, into the public domain, um, which, which was a lot of work uh, um, from a technical point of view, but that was also a lot of work from a legal point of view. Uh, we had to do a lot of uh, work with the librarians, do a lot of due, di due diligence to um, declare these as public domain materials. Uh, so, so what I wanted to do was, uh, you know, think of ways to just visualize, just to just to show, you know, what this means. You know, what does 200,000 images mean? And you know, this is kind of this mosaic uh, right now. It's um, organized by uh, date created, so you could see all these old stereographs. Um, I think these are menus. There's like maps, um, and then you could kind of show it by genre. Again, stereographs, a lot of menus, maps, um, by collection, by color. Um, so this was kind of the first, my first uh, data visualizations, as as, as one might uh, uh, refer to it. Um, and you know, this is kind of where I started to think uh, uh, more critically about how I could kind of combine my my visual art background and my computer science background. Um, part of this. Uh, public domain release, uh, it included this collection called the Green Book Collection. Uh, you might have heard of the, the movie that was released last year, I guess. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar, the, the, Green Book, the Green Book was this uh, travel guide uh, that was published between the 30s and 60s um, that essentially uh, was um, this book that told you, if you were a black traveler, where it was safe to uh, to stay, you know, um, what gas stations were safe to, to, uh, to um, stop at, uh, restaurants, all these things. Uh, and these were completely above ground, you know, publications because, you know, at the time, the Jim Crow era, it was legal to discriminate against people. So the New York Public Library actually has the largest collection um, in the nation, in the world. Uh, because they actually started to collect these uh, these uh, travel guides as they're being published. So um, this was part of the public domain release, and um, you know we we uh, published them um, online. Uh, you could actually browse through all of these uh, all these books. Um, but again, you know when you kind of go through these books, they're they're all text. It's basically a directory of businesses. And um, you know it's it's really not that useful as as images. So uh, what we did is that we uh, you know extracted uh, the the text out of these images, and then we tried to um, use a mixture of crowdsourcing and and uh, some of our data sets to extract uh, the ac actual uh, place where all these businesses were, uh, which is a little bit difficult because a lot of these addresses no longer exist. Um, but you know we created. Um, visualizations that kind of show this in any particular year, the coverage of um, that particular book. And this starts to allow you to, you know, start to ask questions. You know, you might not, you might not make any conclusions from this, but it's just interesting to see, um, you know, what areas had more businesses, what areas had less businesses, why are there gaps in certain areas? Um, and then I started to, um, Think of interesting ways to um, 
to create experiences around this, this, this uh, rich data set. Um, so I created this interface that allowed you to, you know, uh, create a start address. Let's go Orlando. And um, so you enter start and end address, and then it tries to map a trip for you. Did I spell that right? Um, it tries to map, uh, map a trip for you uh, based on this algorithm where you have to stay at a certain, you had to stay at a hotel every so often, you had to eat every so often, and it creates these very inefficient routes, you know, in this case where you're going from Florida to uh, California, you have to go around Texas or, you know, so, so it, it, it kind of makes, um, you know, it, it kind of makes you think about, the, you know, this underlying uh, uh, material. Um, and it makes you think about the, the like, like data in, in a different way, in a very human way, um, an empathetic way. You know, thinking about how it might be different. You know, to travel a different time with a different color skin. Um, so, th you know, this is also where I started to think about data visualization or, or kind of experiences around data as something very human um, and. Um, you know, using language that uh, that you're familiar with, like maps, uh, um, trip planners, you know, things like that, uh, in ways that, um, when you combine it with different uh, underlying data sets, uh, it creates for interesting experiences. So uh, that's where I kind of got into um, this music project uh, that I said I would talk about. Um, so. So this was a personal project. So that I, this was around the same time where I was working at the library. Um, kind of the the the, the original um, the original motivation of this project was to really just learn how to make music because I, I have no music background. Um, and in order for me to, to actually make music, I tried to combine uh, some existing skill sets. So. Uh, my familiarity, my familiar, familiar, familiarity with um, computer algorithms, data science, things like that, uh, and um, combine those in a way that can make music in a, in a hopefully aesthetically pleasing way. So um, I started with this first data set. Uh, so this song is called The Two Trains. So I'll, I'll just start playing it. So this song. Uh, it takes you through a ride uh, on the on uh, the two train uh, along along the um, New York City subway, and it starts in Brooklyn and it goes through to the Bronx, and uh, the music that you hear at any given moment uh, correlates to the median household income of the neighborhood that you're passing through. So um, the start of this song, as you're kind of uh, further into Brooklyn, um, it's relatively quiet. Uh, not that many instruments playing. Uh, as you get closer to like Brooklyn Heights, uh, you'll hear the data, um, the contrast of the data. Um, and as we get closer to the bridge, it'll, it'll get louder. So if you could kind of um, yeah, so the, if you kind of imagine um, kind of the graph of income inequality over, over the two train, uh, it will peak around now. Just Wall Street. So here we're talking about, you know, over $250,000 uh, median household income. And it slowly gets quieter as you get uptown. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead to the Bronx. So, so the difference between um, you know the, the Wall, Wall Street and like just five miles up, you know, into the East Bronx, uh, is um, you know somewhere about somewhere between like 750 thousand to somewhere around like between ten and fifteen thousand. Like that's like the difference. Um, and what I wanted to do was somehow translate that, that contrast uh, into the contrast of the song. So, so kind of the, um, the, the song that you hear, 
you know, the, the, the shape of it, the shape of the song um, uh, correlates to the, to the contrast, the or income inequality, you know, in, that's represented in the data. Um, so uh, a little bit of the process of making this song, um, it, it was, um, it was very difficult. Uh, you know, the, the, the main um, creative act here is thinking about how to uh, map, you know, a specific data point to a sound or to, to audio. Um, and you could do that in so many ways, you know, with data sonification or data music. You know, you could do it through pitch, you could do it through uh, volume, timbre, um, you could do it through rhythm, you could do it, th all these things. Uh, and, um, you know, when you're, when you're trying to convey something like income inequality, uh, it, can, can, it can get very tricky from a uh, kind of an ethical point of view, potentially. So, so for example, if I wanted to say map um, the wealthier areas to happier sounding songs or better quality songs or particular genres, you know, that, that, that gets kind of tr uh, troublesome, you know, when you try to think about that. So, um, you know, one thing I learned about uh, this process uh, through the song is that, you know, with, which, with each um, data set, it, it might uh, require a different way to map it into sound. Um, and I kind of started with thinking about what should the listener feel um, and that kind of um, makes you think about the, the power of music or the power of, of sound or, or, uh, compared to, say, like a chart or data visualization, is that, um, you know, it, 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 it has a visceral, you, you have a visceral response to music and you can't help but feel a certain way, you know, when you, when you hear a, a particular song. Um, and, you know, that's very powerful as a, as a, a creative person, as a musician. Um, but it's, it's, again, it's, it, it can present challenges for a data scientist, uh, for somebody who's trying to convey information uh, without too much bias, personal bias, even though everything is bias. Um, so, so for this one, I wanted to really just focus on um, the contrast. So uh, the algorithm here is that um, uh, the wealthier the neighborhood, the more instruments can play, and then the louder they can play. Uh, which, which the result is that if you kind of look at the, um, uh, just like the volume uh, of the song over time, uh, it will loosely correlate to the, to, the, uh, to the data, you know, to the income inequality. Um, and yeah, I didn't want to make any particular part of the song sound sadder or happier or use different instruments. Um, you know, it, this, the same rules applied to the whole song. Um, and another feature of this song, and, and all of the songs, is that it's completely, it's completely uh, generated by the algorithm that I wrote. So, so no part of this song is manually edited. So basically, the, the first time I heard the song is when I pressed play. You know, uh, um, and, and the tricky thing from a creative point of view is that, um, if I want to tweak one part of the song, like you can't really do that. You can you can change the algorithm slightly, but that would change the entire song. So so um, the result is I, I basically created like hundreds of versions of this song um, uh, by tweaking like little parameters in in the algorithm um, to to make what what you finally hear. Uh, but um, yeah, it's just this very interesting creative process where you you don't really especially because I don't have a music background, I couldn't really envision what the entire song would sound like if I changed something slightly. So, so yeah, it's, it's basically this weird, you know, uh, creative process where you hear the thing that you created um, in its entirety uh, when you press play. Um, let's see, is there anything else I wanted to say about this? Um, so, yeah, the, the, other, the other thing is that I try to match... Um, the sounds uh, that I use uh, with the particular data set that it represents. Um, and you'll see that in some of the other uh, songs that I have here. Uh, but everything that you hear also is uh, sample-based music, so it's not um, synthesized. Uh, and I use that, uh, A, because aesthetically I just think it's more interesting to kind of use sampled sounds. And that also allows me to be more, um, uh, to, to 
to be more uh, specific on, on what I sample uh, and have that also as a creative act, you know, thinking about what genres I should pull from, uh, what artists should I pull from, what sounds should I pull from. So, um, so this entire project uh, is made up of 10 songs. I'll, I'll run through a few of them. Uh, but the general goal is that I try to think of this as a, a, a R&D project uh, where, you know, there, there isn't really a lot of uh, data music that, ex that exists. So um, I just really want to think about, um, from, from a really broad, uh, diverse point of view, uh, what different data sets should, should sound like. So all these uh, songs are made by uh, very different data sets. And as you'll see, they um, require different solutions to, to uh, make the right experience. Um, so for this one, I'll also start to play it. So this one uses uh, brainwave data, EEG data. Um, and it uses uh, data from an anonymous uh, uh, patient who has epilepsy. So brain, brainwave data actually translates really well into uh, sound because it has it uses a lot of terminology that you use in, in music or, or um, kind of sound design. Um, so these are different nodes on the head. Uh, so each each line here represents like different brain uh, different um, nodes uh, different yeah, brain activity uh, along along different parts of your brain um, and the uh, the lines here you know it has this idea of amplitude which is kind of how you know big these waves are the frequency uh, how how uh, close together different waves are and um, I, there's another aspect of how synchronous things are across the brain. Uh, typically speaking, under normal uh, uh, brain activity, your brain isn't always firing at once. Like different parts of your brain kind of randomly becomes active if you're talking, if you're listening to something. Um, so typically, you know, it's this constant rhythm with like some anomaly. Um, but I translated the, uh, these kind of terms, amplitude, uh, frequency, and, and um, uh, how synchronous things are across the brain into the song. So as you'll see, we'll get into the seizure event soon. So what happens during a seizure is that um, the different parts of your brain starts firing, so the amplitude increases. It becomes more synchronous, so it's like kind of this pulsate, pulsating thing. So I map this idea of uh, synchronous activity to, to drum sounds. So you start to hear the drum sounds here. So the, the seizure event um, ends, and kind of what happens after that is the brain is very tired, but it has these random firings of, of, of high-frequency events around the, um, the brain, so you hear kind of these string in instruments playing like a high pitch sound. So again, the, the same thing with this song, um, it's entirely uh, algorithm driven, so, so this isn't a um, manually created song. So I'll just pause it there. Um, so yeah, some of the, um, some of the uh, aesthetic decisions that I made. So as, as you've heard, um, I wanted to use uh, a vocal sample because it, it did relate to um, kind of an individual uh, human. Um, and um, I want to use a, a particular song from uh, 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 Imogen Heap, which I don't know if you're familiar with this song. So she has this, she uses this like kind of weird synthetic, um, like half human, half like, you know, synthetic uh, uh, filter. Um, but it's very like, you know, pure and, um, and uh, um, yeah, I think it, it, it very well represented what I wanted. So what I did is that I kind of split it up into little samples. 
and um, I, I use that uh, uh, as different parts of the, of the brain. Um, and I wanted to kind of, I use this idea of, uh, there's this term in, I don't know, like psychology or some kind of you know, neuroscience or whatever called like um, phantom words. You know, when you kind of have these random syllables playing, you'll, you'll hear words. So in that way, I wanted to um, also engage uh, uh, the listener's brain into, um, you know, creating their own interpretation, you know, of, of the, of the uh, song of the lyrics. Um, and again, like, you know, the, the experience I wanted the, the listener to have, and, and this is kind of um, was challenging as well, because I, I wanted to make music in general that is very pleasing um, and enjoyable to the listener. But um, in this case, you know, like, you know, because um, it is about this kind of seizure event, uh, in order to communicate that properly, like perhaps the listener should feel a little uncomfortable during during that particular event. Um, so, so yeah, that that was kind of like the tricky balance that I that I needed to figure out was, um, yeah, how much should I try to make the listener uncomfortable, you know, when um, when the data is kind of showing that. Um, so that was kind of one aspect of this that was that was very interesting. Um, I did have some interesting feedback from this from people who actually did have uh, epilepsy, um, and they did um, they did uh, say that it did f like the the sound of the song was very um, like familiar in the way in which you know the the uh, the, the suddenness of the seizure event kind of comes on, and kind of what happens afterwards, and I actually ran I actually. Um, some individuals gave me their data to, to generate a song for them, and I was able to do that because of this process, uh, because I have the code that I just run the data through and it creates a completely different song. Um, but it had a, the same kind of shape to it, which is, which is interesting. Um, so I'm gonna skip ahead. So I did a couple of songs between, between these, but um, this one was also, um, pretty popular at, at the time. So I, I made these a little while ago, uh, but this, this became more relevant in the years since then. Um, so this uses uh, data from the United Nations uh, of uh, refugee movement over time. Uh, so this data set gives you um, every single year, uh, it has a list of countries, and then the amount of people that went from one country to another country uh, because of war or, or you know, political unrest or something. Um, so it starts in the 70s and it goes through to 2012. I actually want to update this song with, with uh, newer data because um, you know, obviously that there's been uh, a lot more movement uh, since then as well. So if you can see, it might be a little difficult to see, but uh, there's, there's a map of the world here and um, there's lines going from one country to another. Uh, the red part of the line is the country of origin, and the green part of the line is uh, the country of asylum. So uh, earlier in this data set, um, the movement isn't that far. You know, you have uh, some countries in uh, like the Middle East, Africa, kind of moving uh, within the continent. Um, as we get into the 90s, you'll see, start to see more movement um, globally. So the algorithm here is that um, the distance that you move correlates to the, um, the duration and pitch of the string instrument that you hear. So the farther you go, kind of the deeper, the deeper and longer the sound. Um, and the number of instruments playing correlates to um, the number of countries involved in this movement and the diversity of uh, those instruments correlate to the, di the di diversity of countries involved. So you start to see over time, um, or you start to hear over time, you know, kind of this very layered song um, that has a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, of different types of movement. Uh, and you get a lot more bass over time as well. So this is, this is almost uh, kind of a song about uh, globalization. You know, uh, because um, as we get further along, you know, you can see there's a lot more movement 
you know, across the oceans. And, um, you know, obviously specific uh, conflicts that might have happened. So, so um, a couple things about the, um, the aesthetic choices here. Um, I decided to sample from uh, uh, kind of the genre of American country music. So the, the, the steel guitar is very prominent um, in the genre in this song. Um, you know, I think it's, there's this very interesting phenomenon of, of American country music that like in other countries in like Asia and Africa, um, even ones that aren't English speaking, um, American country music is, is very popular. Um, and, um, you know, there's this hypothesis, uh, there's, there's this hypothesis that, um, uh, you know, American country music has this kind of nostalgic quality to it, you know, this longing for home, longing for the countryside or something. Um, and, you know, both the lyrics and the sounds uh, have that quality. And, you know, the steel guitar is kind of um, reminiscent of, like, the human crying voice or something. Uh, so, so I use a lot of those samples. Um, and, again, I kind of layered them, you know, correlating to uh, the distance that people travel, you know, when, when they're going uh, from one country to another because of conflict. Um, so I'll move on. So this one, so we can turn down the volume a little bit. So here uh, is the Louisiana coast over time. Um, and this shows kind of the, red, the red things that you see is the land loss over time. So this is the coastal regression that's happening in Louisiana for, for a number of reasons, uh, including clim climate change. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm playing this loop uh, of a, from a particular brass band from New Orleans. But as the, um, as the land becomes lost, um, distorting, slowly kind of stretching the instruments to kind of get this quality of like um, instruments like underwater. So you'll see this kind of distortion happen over time. So this was like a very simple process of just looping this particular sample. The, the amount it's stretched correlates to how much land is lost over time. So yeah, obviously, aesthetic-wise, aesthetic I wanted to use a sample uh, from uh, the local area, so using a brass band. Um, and I wanted to have it reminiscent of, again, kind of using water as an analogy to slowly kind of submerge and stretch, you know, the, the instruments playing. So I'll quickly jump to the next one. Not much time is left. So this one was, uh, I think it, it had a similar problem to the, um, to the brainwave one, uh, where you know, I typically try to make interesting sounding songs, uh, but this particular data set didn't really um, give me something uh, that, that would normally be considered uh, interesting to a song. So, um, so this, this was problematic in a, in a couple of ways. So one is that this is an example of um, a data set that's missing. So, um, so the, the goal of this song was to try to translate uh, uh, kind of the diversity of, of Hollywood into, into a song. So A, there isn't really a public data set to do this. So I kind of struggled with this for a while uh, because I didn't want to, 
I didn't want to make that data set because <laughs> uh, I think it's, you know, you kind of, kind of have to do that carefully, especially since um, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, cases where, you know, things can be ambiguous, uh, especially with like gender and race. Um, so, so yeah, so that, that was one aspect of it. And then, um, you know, because, well, I'll just start to play it and then I'll talk through it. So the idea here is that uh, I kind of go through about a decade of, of uh, blockbuster movies. Uh, I think the top 10 movies from each year for a decade. Um, so the, the diversity of the instruments correlate to the diversity of the, of the different movies. So we have um, White male, white female, male person of color, female person of color. So the piano that you hear is, is white male, which is a constant throughout the song. Uh, female, you'll hear a, a, a female vocal. Person of color, you'll, you'll hear a guitar. So the result is kind of like a very boring song. And I could, I could actually show you it. Um... So I'm gonna go to one of the last songs. So this song was um, so this was kind of like the least depressing song. It seems like most of my songs are pretty depressing. Uh, so this one um, uses star data, and actually I'll show you an interactive version of this. Uh, so this was um, this was inspired by um, a piece by John Cage. Uh, he was an um, early avant-garde uh, composer. Um, and uh, he composed a lot with like chance and kind of using existing materials to help him do that. So he used these uh, star atlases to compose. So he uh, created these, um, let's get a zoom in on this. Um, so he had these uh, star atlases and then he kind of uh, put musical staffs over the stars to generate these uh, compositions. So I basically just directly, you know, took that idea. So I'm going to drag. So you could drag to any part of the sky, and I'll just play that part of the sky. And this can create, you know, an infinite amount of music. And there isn't really much to say about this. I guess it really just you know, just an interesting way of manifesting, you know, this, this particular 3D data set. Um, very loosely speaking, the closer the star, the louder it plays. But obviously you're translating a kind of a 3D data into a, a 2D musical staff. So yeah, that was um, that was the last piece uh, in this in this particular um, series of music, um, and you know after that I started to really think more about uh, using other types of media um, as a way to experience data sets in, 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 in interesting ways, and um, also this idea of using time, you know, this time-based medium, uh, which is another. Um, kind of aspect of music that uh, both created a constraint, but also kind of drove um, um, creativity. Um, so I uh, created this piece uh, called Light Reminders. Um, so these are a representation of the lights in my apartment. And what I did is that I installed these smart lights, smart light bulbs uh, into uh, different um, lights in my apartment. 
And I programmed it so whenever I see one of my friends, that, a, that their associate, uh, their, the light that's as associated with them uh, becomes brighter. Um, so the idea is that if I don't see my friends after uh, a period of time, my apartment becomes really dark, uh, <laughs> which wasn't great for um, my roommate. But, uh, <laughs> But um, you know, this this is a. I didn't really think of this as a data project, but but when I when I thought about it more, it is it is a data visualization. It just happens over a really long period of time, and um, it changes how it changes my space. It changes my physical space and changes how I experience my space. And and in in my case, it also changed um, my my French my relationships. You know, and and um, this was just partly driven by the fact that you know as as time went on, it was harder, or you know, I saw my friends less and less for various reasons. But um, this was one way of like not like micromanaging it, but kind of just reminding me that they exist, <laughs> um, and doing it in kind of a very thoughtful way that wasn't you know didn't seem cold or um, you know a little more organic, I guess. Um, I also worked on uh, th this this coloring book. Um, and this, I, I wanted to uh, think of new ways uh, people can um, interact with the data in an active, kind of this mixture of active and passive way, and also using the passage of time um, as, a, as a strength you know, for this. So the idea here is that you know, a lot of these are, are very basic visualizations um, that we see. Uh, but kind of, we're asking the um, the participant to to actively fill in the data. So in this case, this is, this is carbon emissions uh, in the United States, um, and this creates this very again this very slow data visual visualization that that um, uh, appears over time, and it kind of gives you the space to kind of think about what the data means. You know, um, uh, you know, think about particular areas you know, of the country, it kind of it makes you sit with a data set for more than a couple minutes, which is what we usually do. We see a chart, we look at it, okay. but you know, this makes you sit with a particular topic for 30 minutes, an hour, um, and, it's, and it's physical, right? You, you can actually feel the data over time because your hand gets tired. I also use, try to use uh, time you know, as, as a way to convey different ideas. So this activity uh, tells you to see how fast you could color in, um, I think it's 20 football fields in a minute, which is about how fast uh, uh, we're losing forests, uh, net loss, 20, 20 football fields per minute. And the idea is that um, you, probably can't, you probably can't do that. You probably can't make it in a minute. So this uses you know, this kind of idea of time to, to think about you know, the underlying issue here. Uh, so again, this is kind of just, you know, just a series of activities that just use uh, um, the act of coloring uh, as a way to convey uh, different ideas through, through data. Um, I also had a couple personal projects uh, using um, porcelain dinnerware as a medium. Uh, so this was me um, trying to learn more about my own kind of uh, family history as well as Chinese American history. Uh, so my family came here in, in the early 1900s. And this is around the Chinese Exclusion Act uh, that um, basically made it illegal for new immigrants uh, 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 to come from China. Um, and this happened between the late 1800s all the way through to the 1940s. And um, this is kind of a, a graph of, of uh, Chinese immigrants, new immigrants uh, over time. And I, I kind of uh, plotted this data and I, I looked at it and it, it kind of looks like a, like a soup spoon. So, so this is a profile of a, of a soup spoon um, that show this data over time. So you kind of see uh, before the Chinese Exclusion Act, it was a certain number. And then throughout over time, you know, there's there's a, a drop, and then around uh, the Second World War, War 
uh, when, the, when China allied with the United States, they lifted the ban. And then there's another Immigration and Nationality Act that happened in 1965, which, which increased that further. So I wanted a way to, um, to kind of uh, embed you know, my, my history, uh, my family history, in, into um, pieces that, um, that are kind of embedded in daily life and something I can kind of pass down. And, and um, you know, kind of the dinner table is a place to kind of talk about uh, family or talk about history and things like that. Um, and I, I did a, a few more pieces that had to do with different other different aspects of uh, Chinese American history. Um, but yeah, some of these are data driven, some of them are not. So I'll quickly get to uh, where I'm working now. So this was, um, this was actually, this happened around the time when I was designing the climate change coloring book. Uh, I saw that the American Museum of Natural History was looking for a data, visual, data visualization artist to design a exhibit about climate change, which was like kind of a, a, like a very strangely uh, relevant fit for me. Um, so, uh, so here I, um, I work in a group called the Science Visualization Group, and uh, we kind of use new media and new technology and uh, different uh, visual visualization techniques to communicate current science in the permanent um, halls of the museum. So we try to uh, look for areas that, um, areas of science that are, that are uh, more likely to, to change um, or, or our understanding of it to change, as well as uh, sciences that are mostly driven by data. In this case, um, you know, astrophysics, uh, climate science. Um, you know, when you think about the Museum of Natural History, there's a lot of specimens on display, but there's certain things that there isn't really a physical representation of a particular idea. Um, you know, there are things like tree rings and ice cores, uh, but when you think about climate change, it happens over a really long period of time and it happens globally. So how scientists study this is through global data. So, um, so yeah, I, I created uh, a number of um, visualizations uh, that, that are updated as we get new data. So there's kind of a li living exhibit. And um, there are areas where you can kind of play with that data. So this is... Um, kind of a, one of the interactive pieces. So here is that, this is a basic graph of uh, temperature, global temperature anomaly over time. You know, you see it's increasing over about 150 years. Um, the idea is that you can kind of zoom in and out to a particular year or out through the whole 150 year record. So I, um, I added this idea of sliding through and like listening to a particular year. So a particular year, you don't really hear anything. It's kind of this like random noise. But as you kind of zoom out and hear more of that data, you hear a clear trend. So, you know, the lesson being, you know, this idea of weather versus climate, or you kind of need to see, you need, you need enough data in order to make particular conclusions. Um, and I tried to use, again, kind of sound, and, and this is kind of where I injected uh, you know, the sonification work that I did in, in the permanent halls. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's kind of an ongoing, you know, uh, experience, you know, with, with uh, data visualization or data sonification. Um, but um, yeah, that, that kind of concludes that. So um, one last thing is that, again, everything that I do, um, all the things that you see, that you saw today, you could access it on my website. And um, in the documentation, there's links to the code that, that generates every single piece, both the visual and the sounds. So you can either recreate it, you can adapt it. Um, it's all open source, um, and it's all generated using um, open source technologies. Um, and yeah, that's kind of um, that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, thanks for, so much for sharing that. Um, I had a question. So if I look at those individual visualizations uh, with uh, music, how long did it take you to come up with like one of these pieces? Yeah, so each song took between um, a month and a few months. 
Um, and I, I, I was working on these part time, like uh, I was work, I had a full time job. So these were, this was like a personal uh, project. Um, but yeah, there's kind of three phases of work. So one is um, just research, just like looking for the right data set, looking for the right topic um, and seeing what's out there. And also investigating the data set. So trying to see if the data set is interesting or it has, it's, it's, um, can be readily trans, uh, translated into a song. So there's a lot of data sets that I thought were very interesting, but it, but it didn't really make for an in interesting song because of either the shape of it or the topic. Um, but um, yeah, that, so that was kind of the first phase and that, that can take an unknown amount of time. Um, then there's the actual kind of production process, which, which again, it, there isn't really one way of doing it because each, each song, I basically invented a completely new uh, song. So there, I couldn't rely on one particular process. So, so it was trying to think of the right uh, algorithm, the right composition, the right sounds, all that stuff. Um, and that I could go through literally like hundreds of iterations of a particular song. Um, and that could take, you know, like any period of time, but usually like a few months. And then the last uh, period, I, I try to document everything as much as I could. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically, and this, this entire project took about a mm, year and a half, a couple of years, yeah. Um, thanks for the very inspiring presentation. So um, I've, I'm interested in sort of the, how you approach a new data set. And so, uh, and I have an interesting music data set and I'm kind of curious mm -hmm. like how you would approach, like for example, deciding on uh, the length of samples or the, the map that you're using or, so, so in a nutshell, Gary and I have launched a, a live music discovery app where people vote on shows that they hear clips of. So um, what this does is it generates a very interesting data set on hundreds, two, three hundred of shows in, that are happening in various areas in New York City mm -hmm. and sort of some shows that are very much liked and some that are not liked and it's sort of, I can imagine sort of traveling like your train Mm -hmm. uh, and hearing the sounds of various neighborhoods and 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 you know g getting a sense of what these scenes uh, music scenes sound like mm -hmm. um, but you know one of the things I noticed is that sometimes you use samples that are extremely short and and that come from probably various songs mm -hmm. and I, I wonder if you make these sounds samples longer if it starts sounding bad or how do you approach kind of the mixing these samples, which I find sound really nice. Yeah. Yeah, specifically kind of the sample-based process um, has a lot of different aspects to it. So, um, you know, kind of going, going back a little bit, you know, I typically think about the, the end experience first. So, so that kind of gives me the sense of like, generally like what, um, what the listener should be feeling, uh, which, which might reference a particular genre, might reference a particular musical scale, might, might um, you know, reference a particular sound. Um, and um, yeah, typically the shorter the sample, uh, it, it typically works better when you're mixing a bunch of different samples together from very different sources. Um, you know, the, the longer the sample, uh, you know, the more kind of overlap that you have, you know, and, and you know, it, it, that could just get very complex. And it's, it's just more of the fact that I don't have a music background, is that it's hard for me to envision how certain things interact with each other. Um, so typically I try to think of things in like individual notes um, and then particular samples associated with that. Um, so I've typically found that shorter the better, but you know, I think it just depends. <laughs> I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> cool. Hi, thank you for the great presentation. You said you've been doing this 20 years, which is amazing, but what kind of project would you recommend for someone doing this, say, one year? Right, well, I would say to that is that I've been like programming and stuff for 20 years, but um, this stuff specifically, you know, I, I pretty much learn everything as I make a new project. So, so every, each of these, 
projects. Like I pretty much start from scratch. O obviously, I still have a lot of prior knowledge in terms of programming. Um, but um, are you asking like specific like uh, frameworks to use, libraries, technologies? I mean, the way the way I approach things in general, and this might not be for everything, everybody, but um, I just learn just enough that I need <laughs> uh, to to make the thing that I want to make, <laughs> um, and that's kind of like a brute force way of doing it. But um, yeah, I feel it's like overwhelming to kind of learn like generally something, you know, like learning 3D modeling or learning programming generally before I make something. Like I, I just have an idea, I have an end thing that I want to make, and then I just learn the minimum that I need, which is basically Googling stuff and copying and pasting a lot of stuff. And then you kind of learn, you learn over time, you, you get kind of pieces from different areas and, you know, it's basically learning by creating. I mean, that's kind of, you know, it's not, probably not very helpful, but... <laughs> Um, that's that's just my process, and I, I kind of embrace that. I, I kind of embrace the idea that I I don't know I don't know um, a lot of things, and I don't plan to learn. I don't plan to become an expert in anything. Um, and also, I think the fact that the the when you're in the state of not knowing how to do something, I think that's when you could kind of create very interesting solutions that even somebody who's been doing this for 20 years can never think of because they don't have that mindset of like. I don't know how to make this. I'm just going to make this in some weird way, this combination of ways that, you know, I combined some previous experience, you know, and that's kind of how I made this music. I, I didn't use any existing software. I kind of just invented my own tools to do it. And that's only because I had those existing things to begin with. I knew how to code. I knew how to work with data, um, but I didn't know um, Ableton or I didn't know all these other software. I didn't know how to use those things, so I just didn't use those. <laughs> so, so hopefully it created for an interesting um, new aesthetic experience, uh, but yeah, that's, that's how I think about it. Uh, yeah, thanks for this great talk. Um, I'm, you mentioned that um, you, you took a lot of this up to teach yourself concepts of music, and you also mentioned the creative space created by not knowing how to do something. I'm just wondering if you could comment on, as you've done more and more projects and presumably learned more and more about music, does that feed back into the work you're doing? Or, or do you like consciously search for something mm -hmm. you haven't tried before? Yeah, I mean, it was kind of built into the, um, to the structure of this project that, like I said from the beginning, each song um, would require a different solution, or I try to seek a data set that would require a different solution. So I try to have a very diverse set of data sets to, again, kind of force me uh, to, to uh, almost start from scratch, kind of. Um, but, but I did accrue uh, some, some knowledge, obviously you can't help but do that. Um, but I, I typically do, and this is just like a personal bias, but I typically do try to just do something new uh, with every new project, and that, that, that's uh, even identifying just a completely different medium to work with. Um, but you'll find that you know, existing knowledge and existing experiences uh, will, will creep its way into it, even subconsciously, which, which I think is interesting. You know? uh, I think it's just a matter of just trying to do a, a, very, a bunch of different things, and, and when those other non-related things um, when those things creep into what you're doing, uh, I think that's when things become very interesting. Um, so yeah, I, I try not to get too complacent in a in particular uh, way of doing things, but you know, you kind of have to balance that with just being efficient. And you know, if something did work, you know, maybe use some of that, but you know, maybe change it slightly. And uh, it's there's there's really no specific process to it. You know, I try to just um, yeah, kind of. Uh, choose the right process for the particular thing that I'm doing. And, and I just have to remind myself like, to not use a particular skill just because I have it, you know, or, or uh, just because I learned something recently to use it. That's, that's always very difficult to do. Thanks, Brian. This was great. Um, my question is, uh, what was your most exciting project that you worked on? Um, and then what was the most challenging? And it could be the same one, but maybe you're... Exciting. 
Well, I think the... I think the, the climate change exhibit that I worked on at the museum was very exciting because um, it, it was something I didn't do before um, in the sense of uh, designing for uh, the general public. Um, and not only that is that you c I can actually go there and look at people ex uh, interacting with it, which is not something I can typically do with my projects that are mostly online. You know, I know that people listen to things and other people look at things, but I never really actually see them react to it. Um, and I think that's what's exciting about working at the museum is that whenever I'm like working on something or testing something out, I, I could actually go and look and see people's reactions, like completely candid. Um, and, and that's very um, exciting to me. Um, challenging, I mean, all, my, all of the things are challenging. I could, I could probably say that one's probably the most challenging, but it um, seems like a cop out. Um, yeah, I would say between the exhibit and the, the data-driven DJ project as a whole was definitely, the most, I mean, I think anything that kind of gets you out of your comfort zone um, uh, is, is always is challenging, but in a good way. Um, you know, as I mentioned, in some of these pieces uh, were, were very challenging uh, for a number of reasons, but um, yeah, I would say, but yeah, I feel I feel all projects should be challenging. I think because because and I, I, and again, that's kind of related to the other, the other question is that it, you know if you're not really pushing yourself, um, then you know you're probably not you know yeah you're probably not you know uh, you know thinking innovatively or out of the box or something. So so I try to I try to have the right amount of challenge for each project. Um, I just. Um... One of the things I appreciated in your talk is that um, you can, I think, you know, we're all awash in data in our professional lives and in our personal lives, and you're experimenting with the aesthetics and the feeling of data in a way that I've not um, contemplated before, and so it was just very exciting to hear about that, and I wanted to appreciate that, um, and also ask how explicit is that a feature of your work are you trying to get people to feel the data mm -hmm. um, and enter into their consciousness in a different way yeah uh, i think especially with the music project um, that was explicit and, and i think that's only because uh, music is just very special in that way um, that that i can't help but make a visceral reaction um, i just have to make sure it's as it's the right one um, because, you know, I could produce some random song and it, and it would make somebody feel a certain way, but it might not be the, the right thing. So I had to really think critically about that. Um, and yeah, it, it does have this other interesting feature of, you know, when you think of a chart or data visualization, um, it doesn't really have that visceral reaction and also doesn't get stuck in your head in the same way that music does. And I think that's, that's a strength of, of music as well is that you can get, um, a melody stuck in somebody's head, but if you could kind of attach an idea to that, I think that's very powerful and you know potentially dangerous. I don't know, uh, but um, but yeah, that was definitely an explicit thing from the beginning, and and that was because I identified um, that music in particular uh, has that power. So I had to kind of think of that in a in a um, critical way. Thank you very much, Brian. Let's give Brian another round of applause. Thank you all for coming out tonight. And if you enjoy tonight, I hope you'll share with a friend about UX and data. And we'll see you next month. Have a good night.